Hello. Welcome, hey, everyone. You also, he also interviewed uh, President Obama here, so it probably has a certain history of this uh, place. Looked Welcome a little Obama. different then. <laughs> Looked a little different. Um, so you know, I was, when I was researching uh, our interview, I started to look, uh, research like your early life, hmm. and I didn't see much online about your early life. And so, I don't know if there's things that we don't want to be talking about um, <laughs> regarding that, but I thought it might be fun to just start with, like, how were you as a kid, like, and what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were younger? Like, what was the early Jeff aspiring to be? So, uh, how was I as a kid? I was uh, inquisitive, and uh, This I think, is New York City? Uh, I was born in Manhattan, uh, grew up in a suburb of Philadelphia uh, until I was nine, came back to a suburb of New York uh, until I went to college, and then I went to Penn, Wharton mm -hmm. undergrad. Uh, so a lot of New York, Philly, uh, shuffling back and forth. But as a kid, I, I remember, <laughs> I remember a, a few different things uh, that I guess would be characteristic. One is uh, any time uh, my parents would punish me or try to tell me not to do something, I would ask why. Mm. And they would answer, and then I would uh, debate that. <laughs> and then I would debate the debate, and uh, this started when I was pretty young, uh, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. And at, uh, at one point when I was really little, my mom said, uh, this is not a court of law, and you are not a lawyer. <laughs> uh, you're my son, and you have to do it because I said so, which I, I, that wasn't one of my favorite Why? responses. <laughs> yeah. Why? Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's uh, I guess, one thing. Uh, my mom taught me how to read when I was uh, pretty young, mm -hmm. and uh, that, that made a big difference and uh, kind of reinforced this notion of uh, being able to learn anything that I was curious about and interested mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, my great uncle and great aunt uh, buying uh, me a, a world book encyclopedia, mm -hmm. which uh, for those too young in the audience, that was kind of the printed <laughs> version of Google at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Wikipedia, kind of. Wikipedia, yeah, yeah Wikipedia is a better analog. And uh, I just read it. I read it front to back, A to Z, and I just love that stuff. And mm. my dad would, when he would travel uh, for work, he would always bring home a book for me. And I, he, he learned pretty early on that I anything related to facts or information mm. or trivia, mm. Guinness Book of World Records, book of lists, I just couldn't get enough of that stuff wow. as a kid. Yeah. So. Um, I've always, I've always uh, found some uh, joy and, and some kind of passion uh, with information and consuming information mm. and learning. And it started as a kid, and I still have it. That's great. And when you started uh, your kind of business career, were there leaders that inspired you or that you looked up to or that you were, uh, tried to emulate, for better or worse? <laughs> yeah, well, I, we, we may have talked about this in the past, but um, certainly a guy named Ray Chambers, yeah. uh, who's a, a dear friend and a mentor, and someone I just had the opportunity to see um, oh, cool. on the East Coast recently in an event. Uh, Ray was uh, uh, part of a um, leverage buyout firm in uh, the 80s, and uh, that firm had extraordinary success, and actually is credited with uh, creating the first modern-day leverage buyout, a, a company called Gibson Greeting Cards, which for those who have attended business school, you may have done the case today. I see some heads going up and down. And that was just the beginning, and he and his partner had a run uh, from roughly 82 to 87-ish uh, that, uh, despite the fact they tried to stay under the radar, just incredible success. And towards the end of that run, uh, he recognized uh, that no matter how well they did, it wasn't making him happy, and it was, it was really surprising to him. And so he gave it all up. I think he uh, transitioned out of the firm sometime around 87, 88. And he set about traveling uh, all over the world, talking to uh, Buddhist monks and authors and philosophers and uh, just learning about what he was hoping would make him happy and developed kind of a framework for happiness and one of the pillars of those five keys to happiness for him was helping others every chance he gets. And he embarked on a, a career that's uh, largely based on philanthropic endeavors. And he started organizations like uh, America's Promise and uh, worked with the Bush family. He worked with uh, Colin Powell on that. He worked with the Bushes on Thousand Points of Light Foundation. 
Uh, he started Malaria No More. He was integral in the uh, starting of Mentor.org. I mean, one thing after another. And today, he works for the United Nations and the Secretary General, and he's working on eradicating deaths due to malaria in Sub-Saharan Africa. Wow. And so what about him? Yeah, problems. what about him touches you, do you feel like, or that he models? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, there's a number of things. His way of being, he's, um, he's been described, I, <laughs> Jack Dorsey uh, once very appropriately described him as the business Buddha. Mm. So uh, <laughs> the first time I met Ray, I thought that was a really fitting description. The first time I met Ray, a uh, mutual friend of ours had said I really needed to meet him, that he was this extraordinary figure, and uh, she was always right about uh, people like that. And so I met, and we met in his offices in New York City, and I had read a little bit about his background and working on Wall Street, so I was expecting a certain kind of energy yeah, to walk into yeah. the room, and you know what yeah. that's like. I met him at his home once, oh, okay. too. Yeah. So you're expecting like this big, larger-than-life presence and uh, this very assertive, if not aggressive, energy, and I, I, I walked in, and he kind of talks. Very quiet <laughs> and somewhat slowly, <laughs> and uh, it's just—it's it, uh, not at all what I was expecting. And he's so centered yeah. and grounded and self-assured, and he—he he doesn't need to hear himself talk, and he doesn't need to be the loudest voice in the room. But he's often the voice that everyone wants to yeah. listen to yeah. because he's another quality. Is uh, he's brilliant? I mean, he oftentimes talks about identifying points of, of levers, uh, uh, or points of leverage, rather, uh, so that he can do things that uh, can scale on a, on a global basis. And that's always been the way he thinks. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can feel your admiration from him, like when you're talking, that there's that inner uh, contentment or, or peace or com comfortableness, and then there's this outward action to change, an outward sense of being involved and that he doesn't lose his equanimity or sense of spaciousness. No, and equanimity is a perfect word to describe him. He's also incredibly humble. He has no interest mm -hmm. in uh, having his name in lights whatsoever. So just a lot of qualities. But uh, I think uh, the top one for me is this notion that uh, he tries to help others every chance he gets. Cool. And on the uh, topic of leadership, I know that um, in your company, when you look at, let's say, young leaders who you're, you're thinking of promoting, and there's, there's different ones, what are some qualities you look for? What are some things that might, you might look at him or her and say, wow, that person I, I could really see being a leader. That person I definitely could not see. Uh, are there certain qualities that you look for that you feel like are what you want particularly linked in to embody? Uh, well, absolutely. So we took the time, it was almost a decade ago, where recognizing the importance of uh, defining and codifying our culture and values uh, we took the time to get that right. We took it very, very seriously and understood at the time that uh, it wasn't just about talking the talk mm -hmm. and you know painting them on the wall and handing out the mouse pads and the right. laminated <laughs> cards you put in your wallet. That's all helpful to reinforce them, but at the end of the day, you gotta, you got to walk the walk. Yeah. You have to recruit against uh, your culture and your values. Uh, you have to onboard against it and start from day one. You, you should be uh, developing against culture and values and, and reinforcing that learning. Uh, and as the organization evolves and learns, passing that on to your employees and your leadership. And at LinkedIn, we evaluate performance in part based on uh, the manifestation of culture and values. One of the things that I think we take pride in is at LinkedIn, it's not just about the results and results matter, but it's not just about the what, it's also about the how. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we look for people who are reinforcing our culture and our values. With regard to our culture, five cultural uh, dimensions uh, there's uh, transformation, uh, integrity, uh, collaboration, humor, and results. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking for people that can help reinforce those qualities. Uh, I also, uh, beyond those uh, characteristics, I look for people with very steep learning curves because the world is changing mm -hmm. so quickly these days. Uh, people who are, are comfortable with, with uh, static conditions and uh, not changing much, I think, are going to find it more difficult in today's environment, particularly leading an organization uh, in an environment that's so dynamic. So uh, people with steep, almost vertical learning curves uh, is important. Uh, you know, I mentioned humor in terms of uh, our culture, and one of the ways uh, that manifests itself in some of the talent in our leadership is in people who don't take themselves too seriously. Uh, we, the work we do is very intense, uh, all of us in, in the Valley and the tech industry, just kind of nonstop. And I think it's important that people 
know how to have fun and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and have a laugh and also recognize the importance of uh, humor and making other people laugh, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is something that uh, we definitely look for. And so it's, it's people that you look forward to coming to work with every day, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Okay. And then how do you see yourself as a leader? Because I know that there, there is this movement to be compassionate and to be understanding. And at the same time, you know, you're the boss. People need direction. People are looking for guidance. They're looking for a leader to kind of like stand up and stand for something and say, we're going in this direction. Um, how do you balance both of those needs to make people feel heard and seen, but also they're looking to you for some kind of guidance? And at some point, do you ever just want to say, I don't give a shit what people think. I, this is the way we're going and get behind me. And, and at other times, be like, all right, I want to hear from everybody. So how do you, how do you know when one of those is called for than the other or navigate mm. that terrain? That's a fantastic question. I guess instinct would be the short answer, mm -hmm. and it's a continuum. Mm -hmm. And I think taking a cookie-cutter approach to that, uh, which is it's my, my way or the highway, or constantly consensus mm -hmm. building, I, you have to take into consideration the people that you're working with, the situations that you're in. It changes. There's so many right. variables that are changing, and you really... You know, it begins. But you do say sometimes, will you, will you go to each extreme or do you kind of try and stay in the middle? I'm not explicitly going to the extremes. I'm trying to make the right decision on behalf of the organization, on behalf of the team, on behalf of our membership, on behalf of our customers, on behalf of uh, shareholders. Uh, that you have to be thinking, it's a multivariate equation in terms of the, the constituents that you're trying to serve. At the end of the day, at LinkedIn, we're a very purpose-driven organization, so it comes down to, is this going to help accelerate the realization of our vision and mission, or is it not? Yeah. To the extent we need to make a decision, the team is not reaching consensus, I will step in and make a decision. I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. Uh, but more often than not, we have extraordinary talent at LinkedIn, and I'm very interested in what they have to say and what they would recommend. Yeah. Uh, so I try to delegate wherever possible, but there's going to be times where you have to step up and, and make the decision yourself. Yeah. And what do you see as some of the main kind of challenges or issues that a lot of the kind of young leaders in your company face? Is it, is it hmm. uh, confidence issues? Is it, is it feeling like they have a voice? Or is it like, how do, you, how do you kind of, I'm sure you have all kinds of managers and vice presidents and different people that you're somewhat, gro I don't know if grooming is the right word, but you're, you're having to like show them their weaknesses and promote their strengths and you're having to kind of develop them in some way, even though I don't quite like that word, but support them. So how do you, how do you navigate that process with people that you feel like, um, all right, my job is both as their boss, but also as their mentor? Well, there's a, a lot there to unpack. So uh, <laughs> could parse that. Was, any, was that closed captioned anywhere and we could replay it back? <laughs> there's a lot there. So in terms of um, the specific coaching, how to coach, and then uh, this idea that uh, you, know, you want to play to their strengths and you, yeah. you need to know when to develop them. Uh, in terms of some of the things I see most frequently with regard to people who are starting to ascend within the organization, um, that also is a fantastic question. And there is something through pattern uh, matching and recognition that I have seen over the years more frequently than not, which is awareness oh. or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And when you're an individual contributor, you tend to be in your own head, and you tend to be very focused on the work. And the more focused on your work, the more you're rewarded. Ostensibly, you're getting good results, and you continue to do uh, what's working. And as you become responsible for other people, increasingly, at least in my opinion, to be successful as a manager and a leader, uh, not only do you need uh, a very deep-rooted awareness, self-awareness and awareness in others, but uh, as Soren knows, and, and we've talked about on multiple occasions, my first principle for management is managing compassionately, which requires people uh, to not just see the world through an egocentric lens, which is human nature. There's nothing wrong with that. And let's not confuse egocentrism with egomaniacism. Uh, egocentrism is seeing the world through your own perspective, and that helps us structure things and keeps us safe and protects us. Uh, egomaniacism is believing that the world revolves around <laughs> you, which is something else altogether different. And everybody should serve that and, and yeah. lift that up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so when you are uh, instinctually egocentric, uh, there's already this uh, kind of knee-jerk response to tension and conflict, which is to assume you're right, the other person's wrong, as opposed to getting out of your own head, to be a spectator to your own thoughts, especially when you become emotional and to put yourself in the shoes of the other person, understand what they're going through, and to see the world through their perspective. And when you can do that, you can forge a much stronger connection, a much stronger relationship. 
and you're able to make decisions faster, higher quality decisions faster. And that creates a lot of value. But if you're stuck in your own head, for starters, there's a mistake that virtually all uh, less experienced executives make, and, and certainly one that I used to make all the time, which was expecting other people to do things the way I did, which is one of the least compassionate things you can do. <laughs> but it, it kind of, it, it's logical in a yeah. sense. It, it, yeah. it, it makes sense because you're in a position where you're leading other people by virtue of the success that you've had. So why not assume right, right. everyone should be doing it? Right, right. It worked for you. It probably worked for me. <laughs> it should work for you. It also, uh, it's a lazier form of management in a sense because it, it has the least amount, at least in the immediate term, the least amount of friction. This is what I know. Yeah. You do what I know. So I don't have to relearn what you know right, and how right. you do things. But at the end of the day, as we're all more than well aware, we're different. Yeah. You have different strengths than I do. I certainly yeah. hope that's the case. We I, do. <laughs> I, want to surround, I want to surround myself, at least on our team, with people that compliment me. Yeah. And <laughs> not that sounded like something else. That's so funny. I was like, Jeff, I you're pretty, awesome. Jeff, you're like, incredible. I, I'm Jeff, you're amazing. Scene, pretty woman. You know what I've seen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny. Uh, not, not compliment with an I. Compliment with an E. So with complimentary skill sets. Although a, few, a compliment from yeah, time nice, to time doesn't nice. hurt. But with complementary skill sets, and that's what makes a, a team stronger, and that's where you want to focus y your energies, is on understanding where the other person's strengths are, and understanding where their gaps are, their shortcomings, and coaching them yeah. uh, where those gaps exist, so you yeah. can help them become stronger. And recognizing there may be certain areas they're not going to get stronger, and so uh, aligning the role with what works for them. This right. is how you unlock yeah. dramatic, significant value. Uh, for the individual within the company. And again, when you take the time to do that, and it's hard, it's hard. Managing yeah. compassionately is something I say I aspire to do because it's yeah. so hard and it can be yeah. exhausting. It requires a lot of energy to get outside of your own head. It requires a lot of energy to sit with someone uh, in their suffering, in whatever yeah. problems that they're experiencing, when the, uh, baggage and, and, and bad stuff for them has yeah. been triggered. But it's so worth it because when someone knows you're there for them, when you can forge that connection, that's what creates a bedrock and a foundation of trust. Mm, that's sweet. And when you have that trust, you can do amazing things yeah. as an organization. Yeah. So uh, these are some of the things that I try to reinforce with folks, starting with this idea that try to get out of your own head. Even before you get to managing compassionately, be aware of the other people. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, once you're aware, uh, begin to think and manage more compassionately. And I think it can make a big difference. Towards the end of your uh, multi-threaded <laughs> question, you also asked about the difference between kind of managing and mentoring or yeah. coaching. And you may not have used those exact words, but it's an excellent question because there's a very, very sharp distinction between those three things, uh, managing, coaching, and mentoring. And sometimes we have a tendency to use these synonymously, and it's a huge mistake. And sometimes the people reporting through you have a tendency to believe you can play all three roles, and that's a huge mm. mistake. So a manager is there to make sure the work is getting done, to manage how you're doing your job, to express objectives, to make sure the team is on the same page, to track performance, et cetera. A coach uh, can, and hopefully your, your manager is a coach, a coach is someone that helps you learn and grow in that capacity. When mistakes are being made, the coach will take you aside and say, here are some things that I'm seeing, and these are some things I think you should be working on. And, uh, I think you can take a different approach here and let me share with you my own experiences and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. A coach also creates the space to allow for failure mm -hmm. so people can learn. Uh, so that's the difference between a coach and a manager and hopefully your managers are coaches too mm -hmm. and they're not yeah. just focused on telling you what to do right. but they're helping you to do it better. Right. A mentor is someone who helps you understand what it is you ultimately want to do with your career You've thought about all this. And then, yeah, Interesting. Yeah. A, little, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, shares their own experiences with you mm. and uh, can tap their own wisdom uh, to help you uh, better align with that ultimate objective. And so where mentorship and management can be somewhat uh, in conflict is when the best thing for the person in question is not to stay within that role or stay within the company. Yeah. Now, every now and again, you will find a manager who's a great coach and has the awareness to say during difficult discussions, I'm now going to take off my manager hat uh -huh. and I'm going to put on my mentorship hat. Okay. And the remainder of this discussion is about you and your best interests. Wow. Not necessarily. Whether you stay at the company or not stay at the company. For example. Yeah. That's really difficult to yeah. do. 
so I do think there's uh, an important distinction between those three things. Beautiful. Uh, thanks for tackling all of them. <laughs> uh, one of the things I've also noticed, while compassion is definitely um, a focus of yours, and I, I know it's really at the heart of it, if there is any disagreement, you don't hesitate to pick up the phone and say, let's talk about this. Mm. Like, I feel like if there's any, at least you've done that with me. <laughs> like, if there's something you want, <laughs> if there's something that feels like we're not quite getting each other, all right, it's instantly like, let's get it, let's talk about it right now, mm -hmm. let's like work it out. And I, there's like an immediacy towards, it's not just like, oh, Soren might be having a hard day, or so-and-so might be having a hard day. There's a, there's a certain kind of intensity you take, and maybe, I don't know if this is intentional or not, or. <laughs> Uh, or it's true for other people, but it feels like there's a certain intensity you take. It's like, no, I'm not just going to let things slide. Mm. Things are really important to me, and if we can talk it out, we can actually get, catch it in the bud. Is that an intentional thing mm. that you strive, or is that just kind of how you've oriented as a personality, or is that just something I've made up? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm smiling because it's um, fun to be interviewed by someone that you have an opportunity to work with in a capacity outside of the interview because they can draw upon their experiences to ask you questions or reflect things back to you in a way that I haven't, it hasn't happened on a stage before. So I was smiling because that is very, very intentional. And what yeah. you experienced when we've been two working varies. together. Uh, yeah, two <laughs> varies. A lot of superlatives. <clears throat> it's uh, very intentional. And um, the reason for that is, um, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm seeking to understand. I don't want to yeah. jump to any conclusions. Yeah. I don't want to assume intention. I want to understand where you're coming from. I can't do that by guessing. Yeah. I can't do that from afar. Yeah. Uh, maybe Sherlock Holmes could deduce some of that mm -hmm. stuff, and, and from time to time I can draw upon pattern recognition, but rather than guess, I just want to talk to you. Yeah. I want to seek to understand yeah. why you're approaching it this way. Uh, are you having a bad day? Did yeah. you get triggered? Right. Is there anything I can do to help? Yeah. And just trying to understand where you're coming from. Yeah. So that's a big part of it. And for uh, me, it's very relaxing, because I know if you do have something, you'll say it. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, for my side, it's like, oh, cool, you know where, yeah. That's part of it. So now we're, now we're more in sync. Yeah. And if we're more in sync and more connected, I think there's a much higher likelihood that we're going to be successful in terms of achieving what it is we set out to accomplish. Okay. Here's the other reason you feel that sense of urgency or immediacy, is because I've worked in enough environments historically where I've seen what happens when that conflict or friction remains uh, latent or inertial, and it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, how you can start to go off course, and how people can then uh, start to build upon whatever conflict exists, and the defensiveness or the anger or whatever that negative energy is continues to build. And then what happens is it's not just about those two individuals anymore. It's about their teams. Right. Because then they're having hallway right. conversations. And then it's like, yeah, I was in this meeting, and uh, so and so said this, and right. I totally disagree, and they must be out to get me, or yeah. it must be political, or how could they be so ignorant about the situation? And then you start to compound that across uh, hundreds of people within an organization or thousands of people wow. within an organization. And you just allow that energy to become rampant. And that's where cultures, that's where companies go off the rails. Yeah. And that kind of toxicity, it builds over time. And then you're, you're left in a situation where most people are spending most of their time and energy trying to navigate the politics of that, right. as opposed right. to coming together right. to work on whatever shared sense of purpose brought you to that place to begin with. Yeah. 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 So I guess I've been I've been exposed to that enough, and I have suffered in it enough historically to know it's not something I want to yeah. be a part of. I want to try to resolve it. I want to try yeah. to fix it. I want yeah. to bring us back and get us back on the right track. Yeah, yeah, and as indirect a way as possible. We can sit down together. We can talk, but like there's no there's no substitute for you and I talking very specifically yeah. about what that is and as as proximate to when it occurred as as we can. You don't always have that luxury, but if you do. Go for it. Yeah. Beautiful. And are there um, qualities that you feel like, and it may be that compassion is the answer, but are there qualities that you feel like you've learned over your uh, time leading that uh, you wish you knew uh, 20 years or 30 years ago when you were starting in the, in the business world and running companies and being a part of teams and having bosses and being in that domain? Is there 
is there something you would like your, your 22 year old self uh, that you could have a conversation with that you'd be like, Jeff, uh, you know, here's one thing I've learned through time and through heartache that I would be really, could have had less heartache had I known it earlier. So I guess there, it, it's a, there's at least two things that come immediately to mind. One we've talked about, which is managing compassionately and the importance of getting out of your own head, being a spectator of your own thoughts, putting yourself in the shoes of the people around you and doing everything you can to alleviate their suffering or in a, a business environment to achieve uh, shared objectives. Uh, I think uh, the other is this idea that you never want to be giving your power away to things you can't control. Mm. Uh, whether it's uh, an initiative, uh, an evaluation, how well you're doing, uh, you know, the, the team, uh, your role, your title, uh, certain relationships. The more you define yourself by virtue of things beyond your mm. control, the more you're setting yourself up to be unhappy. Yeah. Yeah. And when you can fall back on a clear understanding of who you are, what you're about, why you're doing what you're doing. And you can use that as true north. You can control those things. You can control the way you treat other people. You can right. control your values. Yeah. And I think uh, that's a much uh, clearer blueprint to being yeah. sustainably happy right. than investing too much time and energy in what other people think. Got it. And, and being more, I, I guess the phrase I think is like being more identity-based versus purpose-based or value-based. Identity-based would be I want people to see me this way or I want this title or I want this mm -hmm. people's view of me to be X uh, versus living um, certain qualities and they're going to view you however they're going to view you. Yeah, I, the, right, I, I, right I think to some missing. extent, yeah. And it's, it's interesting, too, because I sometimes get asked the question about when I first knew I wanted to be a CEO, for example. And my answer is I never aspired to be a CEO. As a matter of fact, uh, beyond the age of 28 when I was younger and I worked at Warner Brothers in, in Hollywood, uh, I had always dreamt of being a, a vice president by the time I was <laughs> 30. or uh, I became a vice president by the time I was 28, and I was so excited. It was the last time I ever had uh, a titular aspiration like that. And um, really, for most of my life, it's been about um, the mission or the vision or that mm -hmm. sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the recognition and the rewards, uh, those, thing, those things have a tendency to follow uh, once you're on the right path right, right, and, right. and once you're aligned with what it is you ultimately want, want to accomplish. Beautiful. And um, I know. I I feel like I always can talk. <laughs> I need to follow. I tell other people to follow the time. So we're out of time. So uh, it's time for questions. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was tempted to use up your time to continue, but I'm not going to do it. Um, so if you have a question, we have people with the mic. Um, Grania and Haley, I think, are around. There's always a tendency to pick the people in the front row, so maybe we can start with some people uh, towards, the, towards the back row. Um, we're, yeah, you just guide, but try and make sure we don't just get front row people. If you can say your name and where you're from, and then your Wonderful. Question. Yeah, I'm Daniel Sunshine from Texas. And so one of the themes I've noticed so far is an idea of going from maybe like the individual or the personal impact to more of the macro systemic impact. And Jeff, I'd like to ask you um, if there's anything that comes to your mind, maybe along the themes of like Wisdom 2.0 conference, maybe mindfulness related or you know just uh, conscious leadership related, where it started maybe as an idea um, in your realm or in your office, and then it really you're really proud or feel you know rewarded that it really went out and disseminated throughout the organization in an impactful way. It's a leading question. Did you put him up to that? Uh, did you did you put him up to that? No. You don't even. No, he's not. So a plan. it's uh, <laughs> the reason I ask that. The universe is more is even better than the plan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was at uh, a Wisdom 2.0 <laughs> event during Q and A several years ago, and we had talked about uh, managing compassionately and the importance of compassionate work. And afterwards, uh, a member of the audience uh, came up to the mic and. Um, uh, inquired about my thoughts with regard to compassion and education. 
And uh, I've long been interested in education reform, and uh, I'm very interested in, in this idea of managing compassionately, and somewhat extemporaneously started talking on stage about the fact that I held a great conviction that compassion can be taught. I had learned that uh, after watching uh, a PBS Frontline documentary called A Class Divided, and this extraordinary woman named Jane Elliott. If you guys haven't uh, seen this, I, I highly recommend it in the work she did with her classroom at the time. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the, the answer to the question was <laughs> that uh, I thought compassion should be taught. You said there's nothing more important. And then arguably, <laughs> you know, compassion should be taught the way we teach and emphasize uh, reading and writing and math. And that as I was thinking about it, I couldn't think of anything more important than teaching compassion, that arguably compassion should be the operating system upon which we teach everything else. And uh, so after uh, that uh, panel appearance, after doing the fireside with Sorum, several weeks later, uh, he wrote me and said, I've been given a lot of thought to what you said about uh, education and compassion, and I'd like to sit down and talk to you about that. And you know, you think of Soren as Mr. Wisdom 2.0 and compassion and kind of being easygoing and chill and... He comes into my office and he was like, so I've been given a lot of thought and uh, I think we need to do this. And I was like, okay, well, you know, at some point down the road, and he's like, no, no, we're gonna do this right now. And I was like, <laughs> what? He's like, yeah, it's really important. It's really important. So uh, what do we need to do to get this done? And uh, at first I was a bit taken aback by it. I wasn't expecting that. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, why not? <laughs> why, why not do it? It is really important. We were just talking about how important it is. And so fast forward two, three years. Yeah. And um, I'm working with a company called EverFi, and we're going to be launching a Compassion and Curriculum program uh, this coming September. And EverFi reaches uh, 28,000 primary schools in the country, and we're going to try to build from there. So there's an example of having an idea or a thought like that and then through the people that you are connected to, uh, you manifest those ideas and that energy, and you make it a reality. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I have to say one thing. It's like it's, it's so interesting when somebody says something, and it feels like, wow, that's their mission. I don't know. There's like some time, every something comes out, of, and that came out of your mouth at that moment. And I, I got this hit, like, that's, that's his thing. <laughs> like, that's his, like... <laughs> And I think when we hear that, there's nothing else to do but, like, how do I, you know... I'm very grateful you yeah, did. Yeah, how do, how do we support people in that? So, um, so, and that vision is to have compassion training in every K-12 through school in the country. So. Yeah, we'll start with primary school. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Uh, Chris Bowie. I'm with a group called the American Focus out of Emerald Hills, and we're moving away from you just so you know, so our heads are not in the camera and blocking the stage. Okay. That's why we backed up. Um, I, it was a real honor to work with Ray. I was at the Points of Light Foundation working on America's Promise, and so okay. I, I really share the mentor and honoring of Ray, so thank you again for bringing his name into the space. Um, and around the idea of how you guys do conscious leadership and conscious business and connect with the community and do civic engagement and the way that you engage your employees to make a difference in their communities. What's your vision of the future of how to bring that ethos of what you do at LinkedIn, not just in the, in the Mountain View area, uh, which is a place where I also call home, but also in the broader world? Do you have a view or a vision of how you can take what's going on in your culture and bring that out into the, the broader community? Uh, we do, and it starts with our vision to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce, where increasingly the emphasis is on the word every. Our, our mission, our initial overarching measurable objective to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful uh, is something that we've been hard at work on now for uh, many years and we've made a lot of inroads and, and had some good success. Still a long way to go, but there's roughly 780 million professionals or knowledge workers in the world and uh, there's 544 million members of LinkedIn. So about five plus years ago, we started to recognize that the growth of our signups and our membership was occurring faster than we had anticipated. And uh, we started thinking about uh, what would come next. And uh, the vision was designed to be a true north, a dream to inspire people. It wasn't necessarily something we were gonna measure ourselves against. 
But at about that time, uh, we decided to do something that I had never been a part of in an organization I had worked at, which was to operationalize the vision statement. And it changed everything for us. Hmm. And the example I typically cite is um, when I first joined LinkedIn, we had somewhere in the order of six to 8,000 jobs posted on the site. Uh, this is roughly uh, 10 years ago, nine and a half years ago. And the team responsible for job postings on LinkedIn believed that the total addressable opportunity with regard to high value white collar jobs that would be uh, most relevant for our core audience, there was about 300 to 350,000 of those. And about five or so years ago, we started to near, maybe four years ago, we started to near this 350,000 mark. But it was also about that time where we said we're going to get real serious about that vision to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And so uh, that was something we started reinforcing quite a bit. And at first, I think teams heard it and thought it sounded good, but then went back to work. And I remember one meeting like it happened yesterday, and uh, I was about to leave the room. I mentioned the vision statement. And then I came back in the room, and I said, you all understand, this isn't just a, a bromide. It's actually our reality. Like we have to do this. Mm. It, it doesn't. It doesn't just make business sense. It's our moral obligation mm. in terms of what we do and, and creating those economic opportunities for people in a world that's uh, you, you see widening socioeconomic stratification and, and achievement gaps. And so the team uh, revisited their roadmap and their strategies. Um, we acquired a, a company called Bright that accelerated the way in which we could bring jobs on LinkedIn. And fast forward uh, four plus years, and today we have over 15 million jobs on LinkedIn. Oh. There are, by some estimates, as many as 20 million jobs that are digitally accessible. Not digital jobs, but digitally accessible on the web. And we're ultimately going to have them all. And then we're going to figure out how to get the rest of the jobs that are still in the analog world that aren't accessible online. So that's an example of how we bring that vision to life. There's a very different way of thinking about this as well, which is through our philanthropic endeavors and uh, LinkedIn for good. Uh, we do a lot of work with the, the most underserved segments of uh, our membership and the population. So unemployed youth, veterans, refugees, and people that have all the raw aptitude, all of the talent and the skills, the growth mindset, the intelligence, the perseverance, the grit, the compassion, forged of uh, and through a, a lifetime of overcoming hardships and challenges that many of us uh, can't even fathom. And uh, those people need a hand. They don't need handouts. They need a hand, like all of us did at one point or another in our careers. Mm -hmm. We just needed someone to open a door for us. Mm -hmm. We didn't need people's charity. We just needed access to opportunity. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that's why LinkedIn exists. That's what we're trying to accomplish. So we can do it through our core business and this really unique dynamic at LinkedIn, where uh, the more we can realize our vision, the more business value we create, but the more good we can do in the world. And then we do it through this philanthropic endeavor as well. Beautiful. Do you have time for one more? Do sure. You, one more. Okay. So one moment, one moment. Before we take the next question, I'm, I just want to make sure that we get many voices in the room. And if there's, um, we do have three people lined up back here, and we've had two questions from gentlemen. So I'm just wondering if maybe we should get another voice from a female question, if that's all right. <laughs> Wait, she's been waiting. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Soren and Jeff. My name is Corinne Winter. Um, I run a charity called Mission B, bringing mindfulness to children in schools. And we're in Mountain View. And I want to thank you because um, you gave, LinkedIn gave funding to the Los Altos Community Foundation, which allowed us to go into Mountain View High School, Los Altos High School, Springer and Stevenson. And we just, I just left the homeless shelter up the block uh, on the street, actually. And I was just training the homeless staff and the Mountain View Police Department two weeks ago. So it's been amazing. <laughs> and I didn't think I had the resources to come here today. So I sent you a LinkedIn message this morning, but it bounced, I think, because I don't have the upgraded version. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so, um, so I'm, I'm thankful for Michelle and Soren for making me being here possible today. And um, I just have a lot of gratitude for the work that you're doing. And like you were saying before about it not being charity, it's being opportunity. And organizations like yours give organizations like us the opportunity to make impact. And I wanted to offer um, our services to you to help scale compassion and mindfulness in schools throughout the country. Um, we've been working on that. I've met with the White House, not this administration, the other one. Um, <laughs> 
about um, bringing social emotional learning to schools and we'd made a little bit of headway and um, I'm part of a committee out of Sandy Hook that still is having meetings with the White House and, and, that, and they're engaged in that discussion. So um, I'll try to message you again and give you an upgrade <laughs> and uh, I'll see you soon. But thank you for your support again, Corinne. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so one, um, one quick last question if somebody has one. I know there's a lot of hands. Sorry, we don't have, we'll have to schedule you for a day sometime. <laughs> this is my, uh, <laughs> We'll, we'll do a book from it. We, anyways, no idea. Here he goes. That's going to be That's followed up project. in like two weeks. Wouldn't, it, be wouldn't he be great signed up to for something have new? A, yeah. Anyways. Great for what? Uh, I, no, no, no. I'll, get, I'll keep my head <laughs> out of it. Right, hopefully this is a fun ending question. Uh, since this is the New Leader Summit, I would love to hear your thoughts on what is the new leader? What's the leadership imperative, our growth edge? What's old paradigm? What's new? Hmm. Well, I would start with um, less of a, a view on old versus new and, and just my current view on leadership or the way Great. I've been thinking about leadership. And I think there's a key distinction. We were talking earlier about the differences between a manager, a coach, and a mentor. Mm -hmm. There's also fundamental differences between managers and leaders. And oftentimes people use those synonymously, and I, I think that's a mistake. Um, for me, uh, a leader is someone that inspires others to achieve shared objectives. And the most important word in that statement uh, by far is inspire. And that's the fundamental difference between a manager and a leader. A manager tells someone what to do while a leader will inspire them to do it. And I think inspiration comes uh, largely from uh, three things. Uh, the clarity of one's vision, the courage of one's conviction, and the ability to effectively communicate both of those things. In terms of uh, the old versus the new, um, it's a great question. And I guess, you know, observing, having worked now for the last couple of decades, uh, I could tell you that it feels like, and we touched on this earlier, I think effective leaders today increasingly recognize it's not just about the what, but it's also about the how. Mm. And we all, as an industry, I think, are waking up every day now to the fact that there are unintended consequences to our actions. And we can't constantly hide behind uh, this idea of maximizing shareholder value or delivering against KPIs and objectives. It, it has to be about a sense of purpose uh, and how we go about the realization and manifestation of that purpose because it matters. And to the extent, and it ties back to you know, a big part of today's discussion, which is compassion. To the extent uh, today's business leaders can um, really put themselves in the shoes of not only the people that they serve through their products and services, but the people that they don't. Mm. And understand the consequences of the technologies and the products and the innovation that they're delivering in the world and can proactively start to understand that there will be unintended consequences and some of those unintended consequences will be negative. If we can proactively ask ourselves those questions, if we can proactively be more compassionate, if we can proactively better understand and align the what and the how, I think we can not only do well by shareholders, but we can do well by humanity. Wow. Thank you. I think our time is up. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Our time is up. So um, thank you so much. And I'm sorry we didn't get to every question, but I want to thank Jeff for taking time sure. to join us today. Thanks for